Hey guys, so I have Dr. Jennifer Lay with me today, who is someone that I've always looked up to, and she's pretty well known in the benzo community. Um, you guys might know her from her website, uh, which is an excellent resource for all things benzo related and benzo withdrawal and how to cope through benzo withdrawal. And uh, I learned about her through her blog, her personal blog, where she shares a lot of her own stories, which are incredible. Um, and uh, Dr. Jennifer Lay is also an anxiety coach, and she's really helped coach a lot of people uh, navigate their way through benzo withdrawal and other psychotropic drugs as well. And that also includes myself. She's been very helpful for me as well. So, uh, so Jennifer, I just want to thank you so much for coming on today and uh, sharing your story and going through uh, a lot of the questions that people have regarding benzo withdrawal. Well, you're welcome. I'm really happy to be here and happy to be of service and to be of help. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Jennifer, before we get into a lot of the questions and stuff like that, um, there are a few things I really want to get into with you today. So that includes, you know, our sort of theories based on, um, you know, what protracted withdrawal is, why some people get protracted withdrawal, um, how the symptoms come about, and how to best mitigate those symptoms and navigate uh, your way through benzo withdrawal as best as possible, how to manage that. Um, but before we get into all that, um, I actually wanted to start my first question, which was actually gonna be my last question <laughs> in the interview, but I just have to ask you this. If, do you regret going through all this, going through taking the benzos as hellish as it was, as terrible as it was, is this something that you regret going through? No, I can say that now because I'm 10 and a half years off the drug. Right. Uh, and you know, it took me a long time to heal, a long time. My, my story kind of scares people, uh, but that was, it's just my story. But what I have on this side is remarkable. And I am now the person that I always wanted to be that I never thought I could ever be. And I know that I could not have gotten here unless I navigated benzo withdrawal because it forced me to, to, to look at those four cornerstones of well-being and really put them in the action. And there is something that we know happens that people have like PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, which I definitely had from all of my trauma and one of the reasons I got on the drug. But going through the recovery process on the other side, there's something known as post-traumatic wisdom. And that's what I now have. And I don't think I would have ever had this degree of health and happiness had I not gone through that dark time. So no, I don't regret it, but it was extraordinarily challenging to go through it. Yeah, I mean, it's always a little bit easier to say after the fact, right? But Absolutely. it does, and I know for myself, and I'm not completely healed yet, but when I have those good days or good weeks, the world is completely different to me now. And I feel like my life is filled with so much more purpose and having the right knowledge to sort of um, navigate through my own anxiety and problems in life, which I didn't really have before going through benzo withdrawal. So it's really opened up a lot of windows for me uh, in terms of my health and just everything, my relationships, just everything. So. Um, so yeah, so before we get into all those, all those questions and everything, can you tell us a little bit about your story? Like how, what brought you into this crazy, wicked world of, of benzo <laughs> withdrawal? And how did you like, if, if you don't mind, like sharing a little bit of personal information as to like what, what got you on these medications and, um, just going through that a little bit with us today. Sure. Sure. Um, I mean, I've shared in the past a little bit about my story. Um, try to keep it short. Uh, when I was a little girl, uh, there was a pedophile in my neighborhood and he took a liking to me. And I didn't, I didn't know how to navigate. I mean, who at six years old would know how to navigate that? But the threats that were made that if I said anything were so severe that I just bottled it up. I never told a soul, but I manifested signs of anxiety, even as a little girl, having nightmares and all sorts of things. And, um, but nobody knew what to do with that, right? And I also grew up, I, I was born in 58. So I'm a child of the Dr. Spock era, you know, 
spare the rod, spoil the child. And, you know, so my parents' form of disciplining caused a great deal of anxiety and trauma for me. So I had, I had this double thing. I never really felt safe. Um, and so that I, it, that just grew and grew as a teenager. And um, in my early 20s, you know, trying to go into the workforce and whatnot, I just wasn't equipped. I didn't have self-confidence. I had so much shame. I was just really riddled with anxiety. And I started having panic attacks. And um, so I self-medicated. I self-medicated with alcohol and with street drugs. And um, I was I was just pretty much a mess, as most people are, who have trauma that don't know how to heal that. And sadly, our medical community, even to this day, really doesn't have the best um, practices for how to heal trauma. So I, you know, in my lifetime, I've battled anorexia, I self mutilated, you know, I've, I've abused alcohol and drugs, I've turned to men, I've, you know, I, I've done all of those things that are so unhealthy in trying to be a whole, calm, confident, you know, person. And I had four children in less than four years because I had twins my last pregnancy. I was in a emotionally abusive marriage. Um, you know, no surprise there that I, that I would end up with someone equally as broken as I was. And Loma Prieta earthquake hit in 89. And I had been on bed rest for 17 weeks trying to get my twins uh, <laughs> to the point they were baked enough that they could come out of the oven, so to speak. And that was just so much trauma, the, the way that, where I was when I experienced earthquake. Anyway, um, they had to induce me, get my babies into the world because I was so sick. And it, something about that whole experience unleashed everything in me and I couldn't hold it in anymore. And all I could talk about was my sexual abuse. And I started having severe flashbacks to it. I wanted a divorce. My ex-husband was threatening me and stalking me. And it was just way too much. It was just way too much stress. And my girlfriend said, you've got to go see this great doctor. He's so good. I went and he said, you have a bad brain. You have a bad brain and you need to be on clonopin. You'll need to be on it the rest of your life. You need it just like a, um, you know, a diabetic needs their insulin. No big deal. You know, it's safe. I'm going to give you a baby dose. He started me on two milligrams, but yeah. a baby dose. They're so uneducated. Um, and that was the start. And it was a miracle drug in the beginning. I mean, I have to say the e efficacy is amazing, right? I, I, I wasn't plagued by fears and anxieties. I wasn't tortured with flashbacks. I, I was, you know, I was able to function. I was able to get through my divorce. And I thought life was just great. I had licked this. I was on top of the world. I had figured out really how to, you know, live my best life. <laughs> and it didn't take long until tolerance withdrawal kicked in. And I didn't know what was wrong with me. And they actually tried some antidepressants, which put me in bed for days, suicidal, didn't know what was wrong. Never once thought, Scott, to say, could it be that these drugs could be harming me? I looked just like most people, I looked to the medical community as God. You've gone to medical school, you know the brain, you know the body, you know what I need, you know what we all need, you have all the answers. And so I just really struggled for a very long time in tolerance withdrawal. And I had never dealt with my, with my um, propensity for drinking, which I can honestly call alcoholism. And so, at five o'clock, a glass or two of wine took away the, you know, the tolerance withdrawal, you know, that ang chemical anxiety. So, I mean, for the last decade, I was on the benzos. I think I kind of lost track, but I think around 18 years, that's, that's a good, you know, ballpark figure. Yeah. And the last 10 years of those, I was drinking every single night to stave off, you know, that chemical anxiety. Um, and nobody in my family ever considered me an alcoholic. I, you know, never got a DUI, whatever, but I know in my heart, I was my whole life focused around, you know, <laughs> five o'clock wanting to have that wine or, or, you know, brunches where I could have, you know, a Bloody Mary. Um, 
And, and then one day my friend said, do you think you have a problem? And I said, yeah, I know I do. And he said, please, he had like X amount of years of sobriety. He said, get to AA. So I went and, you know, raised my hand, you know, when they said, you know, in being their first 24 hours of sobriety. And I said, hi, my name is Jennifer and I'm an alcoholic. And it was like a lightning bolt. Just something happened in the universe that it was like, for the first time, I really felt like I knew the truth about myself. And it was frightening, but so liberating. And then I just looked at that little pill that I swallowed every night. And I said, I, I, I don't need this. I don't want this. I'm going to be clean and sober. And that was the start of it. Um, and, you know, from there, I had three different doctors give me really bad advice and damn near kill me. And it was a horrific journey. But here I am talking to you and helping other people. And I'm the happiest and healthiest I've ever been in my life. So it has a happy ending and everybody's going to have a happy ending. I really want people to know that you will get a happy ending at some point. And how long did you go through benzo withdrawal for? I want to go into a little bit more about, <laughs> you know, the symptoms and all that, but, but how long, like from start to finish. And I, you know, you know, would you say that you sort of made it to the other side? Well, that's a really good question. And not an easy question easy answer for that one. It was, it's not, it's not. Yeah. But so I had symptoms to one degree or another, they weren't debilitating all the time, but for about eight years and that scares everybody. Right. But, but what they need to know is the first three years for me, because I was cold Turkey, you know, my story's a little different. Um, were were really hard. The first year off was just a nightmare. But then, you know, around a close, closer to three years, it was getting better. And I decided I was so tired of not working and I wanted, you know, I wanted to get back into being of purpose. So I decided I was going to teach a course about the neuroscience and creativity at Stanford University. I'd never taught, you know, you know a college course, let alone at, you know, a, a prestigious college like Stanford. Mm -hmm. And I, but I did it and it was just too much. And so I had a setback and it took me a while to crawl out of that. And then I was feeling better, still having some symptoms, but able to travel the you know, United States by myself and drive and, you know, have a life, but I still wasn't healed. I was getting closer. And then it's six years off when I really was felt like I was just about to turn the corner all the way. I had another setback that was horrendous. And, and I know that story scares people so much, but that's my story. And it took me more, you know, a couple of years to where those symptoms you know, everything went away. I still have tinnitus that's never left. Um, but everybody over the age of like 50, 55 in my family has it. So I don't know if it's just something I would have ended up with anyway, but it doesn't bother me at all. But all the other stuff, I just, it's gone and I'm grateful for that. So mine was many years, but most people don't take this long. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's kind of hard to, know exactly after you've gone through that what is benzo withdrawal and what's not benzo withdrawal i know a lot of people sort of blame everything on benzo withdrawal but sometimes it's not always the case right like you said you had a tinnitus and stuff like that so um is so you don't have any more lingering symptoms apart from that though perhaps not really not really yeah. You know, I'm right. out and about and traveling and, you know, doing everything I want to do. And I never stop to think, oh, could this bring back another setback? Or, oh, yeah. is this going to rev up symptoms? I'm just living my life. You're, just living, you're living your life and you're just thankful you're not uh, having to go through that anymore. Um, yes. So I wanted, before I get into the other questions, I sort of wanted to give you, uh, you know, what my take is on benzo withdrawal and how symptoms come about. Um, you know, I've been pretty sick with the sort of protracted illness now, uh, going on about five years now. Um, and I actually took it, it wasn't so much for anxiety. I was actually taking, um, my urologist put me on a benzodiazepine for chronic pelvic pain syndrome, um, which I, I believe is sort of manifested in the same sort of root cause of, of all my problems. But, um, and I was only on it for... I was on it for maybe three months and I wasn't even taking every day and, you know, um, hell ensued from there. So, um, you know, I have my theory on what it is and, 
Um, maybe your theory might sort of differ from mine. I know everybody sort of has different ideas uh, as to what it is. Um, and, you know, I don't want to take anything away from her because Dr. Ashton is like the mother of benzoidrol. Like she did so much for our community and I have so much respect for her and um, and everything she did. And she's so, so much help to so many people. And she wrote that manual and, you know, um, there's so much good information in it, but at the same time, you know, that was a long time ago now. And I feel like some of the information in that manual could use a little bit of updating. Now that's just my, totally agree with you. Yeah. Now that's just my perspective. <laughs> I know anytime I've ever said anything like that before, people want my head <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I understand it. I'm not criticizing Dr. Ashton. I have so much respect for her, but I think, you know, we need to evolve a little bit here. We can't just say, well, you know, benzo withdrawals and everything's in this manual and everything else needs to be censored and we can't hear any other theories on it because we're not we're not really getting anywhere. We're just sort of spinning our wheels if we do that, right? So I'm going to go through my three with you today and then we can sort of touch on, you know, what your thoughts are on it and, and maybe your own ideas as to what benzo withdrawal is. So, um, so my theory is that people sort of have this pre-existing gut injury or possibly gut injury from the medication itself. So some doctors, what, you know, will call it intestinal permeability or flattened mucosal lining. Um, I think leaky gut is the most important, uh, most common term for it. And leaky gut is where your intestinal lining is broken down and you have small gaps in it, allowing for food, chemicals, and toxins to enter into your bloodstream. Now you could get leaky gut for many reasons. So whether that be um, antibio antibiotics, all sorts of medications, uh, proton pump inhibitors or other types of acid blocking drugs uh, could be from chronic stress. So there could be a, a, a wide variety of uh, factors at play here. And I was, I was so sort of lucky in that I had a doctor who was some, somewhat knowledgeable on this topic. So she planted the seed in my head that perhaps this isn't um, solely a brain injury after all. And over time, I talked to more and more people. And as they healed their gut and leaky gut, their so-called sort of benzo brain injury got better and went away. And that was the case for myself as well. Um, all these years, you know, for over four years, um, I thought that I had a, a brain injury solely from the benzos. And I was kind of just told to sit back and give it time. Um, and the body does have the you know, the sort of miraculous capability of, um, of being able to heal itself. Um, and for many people, they do he heal over time. But I think in my case, maybe I was just too far gone. Um, and there are some people out there like myself who need some intervention in order to heal. Um, and they need to act actively fix their gut damage. So, um, and certain types of pathogenic, uh, bacteria or yeast could overgrow in the intestines and cause all sorts of problems, including leaky gut. So my guess is, you know, and this is just from anecdotal evidence I've seen that mostly everyone in protracted withdrawal has some case of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or uh, yeast overgrowth, or sometimes both, which was the case in, in, my, uh, in my case. Um, now there is some literature showing that benzodiaz benzodiazepines block diamine oxidase which is an enzyme we naturally produce to break down histamine mm -hmm. in the body. And mm -hmm. when you block this enzyme in your body, uh, your body loses its ability to break down histamine naturally. And it could take some time mm -hmm. to rebuild that again. And the double whammy is that when you have leaky gut, food and other elements can penetrate through your gut wall and enter your bloodstream, which will cause mast cell activation. And mast cells are your body's natural immune response to what it sees as toxins or invaders in your body. They're there to help protect you. And one of the main chemical mediators of mast cells is histamine. So not only have you blocked your ability to produce the enzyme that breaks down histamine by taking a benzo, 
but you also have an abundance of extra histamine being produced because mm -hmm. you have leaky gut. And the more histamine you produce, the more cortisol you'll also produce to counteract that inflammation. So hence that never ending state of fight or flight. Now, cortisol levels rise at their highest level in the morning as you wake up and diminish at night before you go to sleep. Um, so often people have crazy waves in the morning and the symptoms might gradually get better as the day goes on, but uh, there are other factors at play there. So it kind of depends sometimes on what you do and what you might eat during the day. So not everyone mm -hmm. follows that pattern. And the main factors in activating mast cells are infection or viruses, food, stress, exercise, and uh, potential other, other factors as well. Um, and the main symptoms of histamine intolerance are allergic type symptoms, brain fog, chemical anxiety, insomnia, vision issues, skin issues. You could get benzo belly, acid reflux, bloating, nausea, air hunger, chronic pelvic pain syndrome, which is what I had, and uh, plenty of other symptoms as well. Um, and histamine is said to have kind of a bucket where it fills up where you get, um, you know, more of these crazy symptoms until it kind of cascades all over your body to the point where you're extremely sick. And then as your body is able to catch up and break down the histamine, you'll get maybe these sort of longer windows and you'll start feeling better. And then of course the waves could come crashing back down and, and <laughs> throw you back into hell again. But, um, and leaky gut could also cause several nutritional deficiencies, which I also see a lot with people um, that could set off a lot of symptoms. It's also said to be involved in the process of autoimmune disease, which I also see a lot. And if you look in, mm -hmm. into, um, you know, leaky gut, candida and SIBO groups, they all have the exact same symptoms right across the board. So people with SIBO, mm -hmm. again, will have the brain fog and chemical anxiety and vision issues and memory problems and rashes and blah, blah, blah. And I even read a study recently that showed that long haul COVID is a manifestation of mast cell activation syndrome and mm -hmm. mast cell activation <laughs> syndrome is most often, often a manifestation of leaky gut. So, and on top of that, there's another study showing that people leaky gut had worse COVID infection outcomes. And again, aside from the, the potential lung and heart damage, you'll see people long haul COVID with a lot of the same type of symptoms that people in benzo withdrawal will have. Again, with the brain mm -hmm. fog and memory, Alzheimer type symptoms, um, you know, chemical anxiety and so on and so forth. And their doctors just don't really have a clue as to what may, might be causing it. So really what it all boils down to is this sort of gut brain axis and resulting neurological and physical symptoms due to this injury. And just because you have neurological symptoms, um, it doesn't mean that those symptoms are derived necessarily from your brain. They can be, but not necessarily. Um, now, with all that being said, I mean, there's a lot of debate as to how to fix this problem. Um, sometimes people just heal in time. Like I said, it doesn't necessarily require intervention. In my case, it did. And my intervention fixed my symptoms. Now I'm not saying that, you know, this will be the case for everyone. So before people come after my head, this is a theory that I have, <laughs> and I have seen people heal by taking dietary intervention or sometimes, um, you know, there are certain medical routes that you could go through that, that might be able to heal this, but um, I'm not really going to get into, the, into that myself today. I'm not here to sort of, you know, give this sort of magical cure to people. I'm not here to sell you anything, um, but I just wanted to give my theory and um, I'm just interested, Jennifer, because I know that you've talked in one of your blog posts about how you believe that um, benzo withdrawal and psychotropic drug withdrawal is very much like gut related. So I wanted to sort of get your take on that and sort of see what your understanding is of it and your theories on that. Absolutely, Scott, we are so on the same page. I truly believe that if you heal the gut, you're gonna heal everything that needs to be healed, that a lot of it is gut related to one degree or another. And, um, you know, you talked about leaky gut, you know, it's the tight junctions and they rupture. And now what we also know is that the blood brain barrier has those exact same tight junctions and they burst open. So now you've got leaky brain and we don't, the science isn't catching up yet 
um, you know, there's just not enough research yet to really know what happens, what, what you know, what do, what is the cascade of symptoms and events that happen due to the, due to the, the, the leaky brain? You know, we have a long ways to go. Um, I have a very dear friend who's a psychiatrist I, I've, I've, you know, sent some clients to him. He's, I've trained him in, in benzo withdrawal. His name is Dr. David Rusin. And mm, he just yeah. wrote to me. Recently. Yeah. He just wrote to me and said, you know, you're spot on. I'm reading more and more in different research journals about gut microbiome that we're learning so much. It's, you know, it's the new frontier for sure in medicine. Um, and we still have a lot to learn, but at least what we do know is that our health rests on the health of our gut microbiome. And, you know, there's five different types of microbes that live there and they all need to have a good balance and, and be nourished. And so when we, when we take care of our gut, our gut's gonna take care of the rest of us because yes, you talk about that brain gut access, it's a real thing. The, the immune system, the nervous system, um, you know, the gut and the brain, you can't really pull them apart. Yes, they're different organs, but they're so interconnected by their communication that goes on nonstop that, you know, nothing works in isolation. So we, so we need to be aware of that. And, you know, I, I've had people say, you know, it's not my stomach, it's my brain. I'm like, yeah, but <laughs> let's work with the gut. Let's, you know, work you with that. Separate and that two, yeah. Exactly. And, you know, once I had my six year setback, what I found so remarkable was two weeks after I changed, radically changed my diet, my symptoms just like, wait, what? Like I used to wake up, not, not all the time, but frequently enough with nerve pain. And, you know, I just thought, well, you know, maybe I'm, this is just going to be a lingering thing. And, you know, I'm also getting older, but I mean, it was so severe, Scott, I would writhe in the bed and I never take over the counter anything because I'm just you know, <laughs> too scared. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Once bitten, twice shy. So I would just stay up all night writhing in pain. It was so awful. And two weeks after um, I radically changed my diet, that went away, never to return. And I have had chronic constipation since I was a little girl. Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, I, I just thought that was just the way my digestion was. And like, I now have Bristol four poops. You know, we look at the <laughs> Bristol, you know, the poop scale, you know, from, from one to seven, you want to, you want a four. I have as Dr. Bol Bolsowitz, um, Dr. B, we call him, you know, he wrote the book fiber fueled. He's such a, a great knowledgeable, uh, he's a gastroenterologist, you know, in the gut microbiome. And I took his master class for seven weeks and it was just fascinating. Mm -hmm. But as he says, my poops are glorious. So I now have glorious poops, <laughs> which is so exciting. But mm -hmm. you know, what I see in the toilet is an indication of what's going on or not going on in my gut. And I have a healthy gut now. Well, there you guys have it. Dr. Dr. There, Lee has glorious poop. <laughs> Dr. Jen has glorious poops and Dr. Jen wants you to have glorious poops. And you know, you talk about histamine, yeah. you know, you talk about histamine and some of the other things and, and um, all really important. And the other things to kind of think about as we're not that we're going to, you know, unpack it or all, but just, you know, people in benzodrol do talk about FODMAPs, you know, the fermentable, fermentable oligosaccharides, uh, monosaccharides, disaccharides, poly polyols. I never know if I'm saying that right, word right, but the, the FODMAPs, um, and we need to think about those, but also the oxalates as well. Um, so, you know, there's a lot to unpack um, and, and I'm learning more and more. In fact, I'm I was trying to start over the summer, but next month I am going to take, it's going to take a year or more. I will um, become a registered holistic nutritional or nutrition practitioner because oh, wow. I am so dedicated to this knowledge that you have to heal the gut. And I want to know more on how to help people in benzo withdrawal heal. I mean, I know enough and I know some, but I want to know a lot more. And, and, and then I'm also helping people as an anxiety coach with my thrive with Dr. Jen .com website to just avoid going on, you know, psychiatric medication. Um, and so I know that I've got to know a lot more about the gut to really, you know, be preventative too, because for all of these things, the gut's going to play an enormous role, if not the entire role.
I yeah. so agree with you. We're on the same page. Well, if you if you create a course on um, you know Udemy or whatever, I'm I'm the first one to sign up. But it's amazing how people <laughs> it's amazing how people won't necessarily link their constipation or diarrhea or bloating or their kidneys, even their kidney stones or rust leg syndrome. Right. They won't even think that that's part of maybe the you know benzo withdrawal, right? But right. from right. my perspective, it's all linked and. The reason yes. why I think that is because as I started to heal my gut, all these things started to go away for me. And I've had kidney stones for 20 years. I haven't developed for the first time this year, I haven't developed one new kidney stone. So, and, and Excellent. right. So when you start changing your diet around, I think a lot of right. people are on to the fact that you need to change your diet around a little bit. Like you can't, you know, I, I don't think anyone does well in benzo withdrawal if they're eating sugar and eating tons of carbs and, um, you know, just living life as they normally would, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it definitely requires some intervention on, on some part. Right. Um, I think a lot of people yes. are on to that. I think that I have personally seen people who, who do change their diet, um, and try to manage the stress as best as they can, that they do seem to heal faster. That's for sure. So, yeah. And, and that might be the only point that we disagree on is that complex carbohydrates are what fuel our body and, and our brain. So the, the nutritious carbohydrates are what we want. You know, I think people hear high carb and, you know, or, or carbs and they think, oh my gosh, you know, I can't eat a potato or some beans yeah. <laughs> or whatever. Yet those yeah. are the foods that are the healthiest for us. But we definitely, the processed foods, oh my God, and most everything you know, these days is processed unless you're eating whole foods, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, because they're also so convenient, you yeah. know, alcohol, terrible for the gut, you know, stimulants, yeah. you know, caffeine, yeah. just yeah. all of all of, you know, the corn starches, which people get, you know, just by the bucket loads, if you're drinking sodas or even processed foods have so much hidden sugar in them. Totally agree. We, the, the, the cleaner you can get your diet, the better. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. So I, I'll just say this and we're not going to get, we, we, you know, before the, uh, before the taping of this, we said, we're not going to get into this, but like, so Jennifer has a right. completely opposite diet of what <laughs> I, you know, I'm on a carnivore diet and, and Jennifer is on a vegan diet and I have nothing. And I just want to say that I have nothing against eating plants. This is just what's worked best for me. I'm not saying it's going to work for, right. for everybody. But I do plan on re reintroducing plant foods at some point. <laughs> I'll just say that. But excellent. Um, yeah. No. We we. It's everybody's everybody's got to come to a decision as to what is best for them. And all I can do is offer the science that I've learned. I was recently yeah. uh, certified in plant based nutrition from Cornell. But certainly, all I'm going to do is just say to people, "Here's an offering. Here's what I know." But at the end of the day, everybody's got to find their way and figure out what they think is best for them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to get into a few questions with you now. Um, and I put, uh, I put forth uh, to, to people in the forums to sort of ask some questions because, you know, you're a celebrity in the, in the benzo withdrawal community and uh, people want to hear what you have okay. to say. So, um, so <laughs> by overwhelmingly, most people want to know about symptoms, right? And I could tell you just from my own experience, you know, it really helped to hear other people talk about their symptoms because it gave me something I could relate to. And it made me feel like I wasn't just alone in having this crazy brain fog and feeling like I was living on Mars. So overwhelming, overwhelmingly, I'd say 80% of the people asked about symptoms. What are the most predominant symptoms? And, um, you know, how, I guess we'll talk about that after, but how to best manage them. So maybe you could just get into the symptoms first and, and, you know, discuss that. In detail. Sure. Yeah. It's a great, it's a great question. Um, but I just have to say, I, I don't feel like a celebrity and I don't want to be a celebrity. And that, that word, when you said that just kind of <laughs> jolted me, like, oh, I, I just, I, I just consider myself truly another bozo on the bus. I'm someone who's lived through this. Yes. I happen to have an education that I can you know, offer it and apply, but I'm just a fellow benzo buddy on this journey and just want to help other people. But years ago, I put out to the, my followers who, who, you know, read my blog and I said, 
send me your symptoms. So they did. And over time, I compiled a list and a very sweet woman in the community took that list and alphabetized it for me. And then I shared that with the community. And I think it's a pretty comprehensive list. And it's a long list, so many different things that we can have. But I think kind of the top, you know, the top players are insomnia, anxiety, panic and terror kind of go into that anxiety, pain, whether that's muscle pain, joint pain, ligament pain, you know, bone pain, um, nerve pain vision problems, uh, definitely d- digestive issues, whether that's, um, you know, constipation, diarrhea, you know, white colored stools, yellow, green. I mean, things have, you know, we look in the toilet and go, oh my God, what's happening? Um, intrusive thoughts, racing thoughts, feeling like you're going crazy. Akathisia is one that unfortunately yeah. is so common and that it's really hard to describe akathisia. You know, you can read definitions, but if you have it, you know it. It's that urge to move, but it's more than that. I mean, it's just this overwhelming pressure. And I mean, it's I, I would get it from time to time and it was really horrible. Suicide ideation, severe depression, um, cognitive inabilities. I couldn't, oh goodness. I mean, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. Um, memory, memory loss. I can, I can remember opening up the refrigerator. My keys were in the refrigerator. I went, how the heck did they get in there? And opening up my call closet and there were, there were, uh, you know, toilet tissue and stuff, uh, paper towels. And I thought, who bought that? When did they get there? And, and I never could figure out when I went to the store. Um, you just lose a sense of yourself you really don't know who you are. And it's that, you know, that sounds kind of benign. It doesn't sound that dramatic, but when you are in that place where you literally don't recognize yourself, and I'm not talking about your, your reflection, but you really just truly don't know who you are anymore. What do you believe, you know, everything about yourself? You're, it's like you're in a black hole and it's, it's very, very, very frightening. And one of the other symptoms is that we talk about benzo withdrawal incessantly to anybody who will listen. And it's not that we're of weak mind or weak character. It's just another benzo withdrawal symptom that we are so focused, dialed in 24 hours a day on ourselves, me, 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 me. And it, um, and it, it makes recovery difficult because we burn people out. Compassion fatigue sets in. So just off the top of my head, I didn't, you know, make a list. I mean, those are some of the top ones. Um, and maybe I've missed something that you can chime in with and we can add to it. But but you can, oh, tingling, jerking, monoclonic jerks, you know, feeling like you're about to have a seizure or a stroke, heart palpitations. I mean, oh, yeah. every part of the body, every part of the body gets impacted. I don't believe there's any other illness on the face of the planet that comes close to the misery of going through benzo withdrawal or maybe other psych meds have the same components, but, you know, a family member battled cancer when I was sick and, Mm -hmm. you know, the family knew how to support that person, you know, take casseroles and, you know, but that person got well. And, and when we're in benzo withdrawal, you know, and, and I have to say, you know, that person as scared as they were with that diagnosis still had access to their cognitive capabilities, they could rationalize and think through and in benzo withdrawal. I mean, everything is stripped away from us for some of us. And we don't have, you know, we just, we have no part of us that's functioning properly. And people don't know to bring us a casserole. They don't know how much support we need. You know, we get told, think happy thoughts, you know, or go to the doctor, get another pill. You just need, you know, Anyway, it's it's just really frustrating, and the and the list is really long. So Scott, what might have I, what did I, what did I leave out? What can you add to? Uh, it? I think you pretty much covered it all. That was a lot of symptoms. I was hey, I, I'm not sure if we mentioned rashes, which has been a very persistent sy- symptom of mine. But I'd say for you know just personally myself that you know, and you mentioned all of these like the vision issues, the chemical anxiety, the brain fog you know, living on, you know, like you're living on Mars kind of thing and the memory's completely gone, you know, but what, like, what were your most persistent symptoms? Like personally, what, what were some of your worst ones and most persistent ones? 
Gosh. Um, well, my symptoms started when I started tapering because an ill, you know, an uneducated doctor gave me, you know, bad advice. And he wanted me just as they usually say, because this works for opioids, you know, just take a quarter of the pill out, you know, in a month you'll be done. Um, so my symptoms started right away and they started with severe derealization, you know, that surreal feeling of being in the world, um, horrible head pressure and disequilibrium and jelly legs. I was so weak and, and I had a lot of pain. I had terrible nerve pain and bone pain. Um, and I, I became bedridden off and on in, in my taper. I mean, it got pretty severe. The insomnia some nights, many nights, I'd go to bed at six in the morning and only sleep for, you know, a few hours. And, and all those hours of the, of, of the, you know, the deep dark night when I knew my neighborhood was sound asleep, those were some very dark times for me. Um, but I think some of the symptoms that were the hardest, I truly was the poster girl for intrusive thoughts around death and dying. It was yeah. nonstop. I couldn't be around a pregnant woman because she was going to give birth. What's the opposite of that? If I saw someone with a Band-Aid or a bruise or a cut or, you know, a cast, oh my gosh, it was terrible. I got to the point where I couldn't, I couldn't pull weeds in my garden because I was killing the weeds. I mean, every, it was like, it was all I could think about. And yeah. I was really terrified that I was never going to be able to have normal thoughts and to not be afraid. I mean, I, I was afraid feeling fear. It was truly the only emotion I could feel for you know, almost all day long and no human being can sustain that. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's torture. I mean, we have to sustain it. So mine, it was, it was being bedridden, so debilitated, the intrusive thoughts um, and feeling very abandoned by the medical community, my family, nobody understood. And just that sense of abandonment and isolation. Um, and, and for me, uh, guilt and shame kicked in. And I should say, I didn't mention that in, in the list of symptoms, that that's very common in benzo withdrawal, that we have a lot of guilt and a lot of shame. Mm -hmm. And I just was really convinced that um, I was a terrible, horrible person. I deserved probably what I had, even though I really didn't feel that way, but that my brain just kept wanting to tell me that. And um, it, it was it was it was just the darkest darkest time to live through because I was bedridden and then once they cold turkeyed me, <laughs> oh my God! I mean, whatever I thought I was suffering in my taper, Jesus, um, the gates of hell swallowed me. I hallucinated every day for about six weeks. I mean, I lived in crazy town, and um, I I just it's you know it it's been ten over ten years, ten and a half years. But it's still really hard. Like you notice I'm starting to squirm, you know, <laughs> my, my, you know, my, it's still hard sometimes to share that degree of suffering. Um, it was intense, but I survived. And if I survived, everybody else can survive. We just have to hold on. And there are some things that we can do, you know, to help navigate. It's just sadly, there's nothing that we can do that's going to um, instantly take everything away. Right. Yes. I remember, you know, when I, I, I actually cold turkey my benzo in the beginning and, um, you know, I ended up in the hospital and I had the akathisia and for years I had that doom feeling, like, uh, you know, I was about to die, you know, and, and, um, it was just so persistent, you know, it's like when I, when I look back on it and even now I'm not fully healed, I still have my problems, but I'm a lot, very, I'm at least functional now. And, I think, you know, the way I feel now maybe would send normal people to the hospital, but uh, the way I feel now compared to how I felt even a year ago is so different that I am so appreciative of it now. But you touched on, um, you touched on navigating a little bit through relationships there. And that was another question that someone had is how to, you know, deal with a family member, say be your, your wife or husband or children or people who don't really understand what you're going through. I know personally myself, um, it's led to a lot of relationship problems for, you know, with my friends, 
with my wife, mm -hmm. with my family who they all think I'm just crazy and it's all in my head and it's just stress. And, you know, there's a lot of people like me out there in the Benza world who don't get that support and kind of the opposite. They get the sort of anti-support people kind of gaslighting them and blaming on them and saying they're crazy. And it's not like we get that a lot from the doctors just to begin with. And it's that much harder when no one believes you. So we have to turn to each other for support. So do you have any recommendations on how to sort of deal with that, like deal with the family issues and all that stuff? Sure. Uh, just top of mind tips would be, first and foremost, we can't control people, places, or things. So if a family member, a friend just can't open their mind and wrap their head around it, let it be. Stop trying to get them to understand. They, they just, for whatever reasons, that's, and that's their issues, let it go. Just accept them in their inability to accept what you're going through. Um, yeah, just don't, don't give it too much more airtime and energy. Let it go. Second, unless you've really lived through this, there's no way you're really going to be able to understand it to begin with. So just tell your family, here's the most helpful thing you can do for me is to ask me two questions. What do you need? How can I help? That's the best that any of us can do for one another. Because the minute we start telling people, well, you should do this or do that, that's unasked for advice. And that has a level of judgment in it. Because if you're saying do this, what you're really saying is you're not doing it right, you need to do something different. And anytime any human being feels judged or evaluated, we go over into that protect state, that you know sympathetic fight or flight or parasympathetic dorsal vagal shutdown. That's not where we want people to be. We're not at our best there. So uh, tell them, just ask me, what do you need? How can I help? Um, and, and hopefully, you know, they can remember to do that. The other thing to do is if they are getting in your face or giving, you know, doing something that, that is upsetting to you, use this form of communication when you, I feel. And then you just say, when you say blah, 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 I feel. Now there's a trick to this because you have to avoid passing judgment. So you can't say when you're being a jerk to me, you know, I feel you because that's got judgment. You need to be very black and white and crystal clear about what it is that they're saying or doing. I feel. So you need to be honest about that. And then the other bit of advice, which, you know, you said earlier, you know, they come after you, you know, for your head. Uh, people get really upset with me when I say this, but stop talking about benzo withdrawal so much mm -hmm. and it's hard to do i know because we're miserable and it is a symptom as well but if we can do our best to kind of be more present for our friends and families you know hopefully they don't get so burnt out and and we can be among them more often i had a friend pull me aside paula and told me you have to stop talking about it. And I remember I was so pissed off with her. Mm -hmm. You don't know how much I'm suffering. I've got benzo withdrawal. I'm so special. You know, you just don't understand. Oh. Yeah. I was really hurt because it just felt like she didn't care, but she really did care because what she was trying to say was this isn't working to your best advantage. It's pushing people away. And so I took her advice and I stopped talking about it and people started coming around again. And my life got a little more bearable for that. So it's okay to talk about it some, but turn the volume down some and reach out to the people that are in the community that understand and can listen and can support you. So those are the top of mind things that I think can help keep relationships, you know, at least, um, you know, treading water, so to speak, until we're really back able to just really, you know, swim with everybody again or at least help repair some of the ruptures that happen when we're in benzo withdrawal. Yeah, absolutely. And I know just from my own experience, like I haven't gone through this for a long time now, is that kind of staying in your business in terms of not trying to convince people of anything, not trying to tell your, your mother or someone, no, I'm not crazy. It's benzo withdrawal. You don't understand how it works. And, you know, um, Staying in your own business like that, I think, like really helped me anyway. 
but I think that's fantastic advice. And I think that's one of the hardest things about going through benzo withdrawal. That's the worst symptom is having to deal with other people, right? So, um, Absolutely. And especially for those of us that came to this medication because of our anxiety, deep down inside, for most of us with anxiety, we already feel less than, we don't feel good enough. We don't have self-confidence and self-worth. Mm-hmm. And, and I think whether or not we've actually given you know, put it into words, I think there's, you know, there's this sense of fear of abandonment. I'm not going to, you know, somebody's going to abandon me. I'm not someone, you know, I'm going to die because I can't take care of myself. So when the people that we love and, you know, we, we hope and trust that are going to be there for us when they're not, it just strikes at the very heart of our deepest fears. Mm -hmm. And, and so we need to be aware that that's probably going on and, and work with that. And, you know, and there are ways to work with that. But it is hard for us to, to do the deep emotional work you know, and work on all the trauma and stuff and binge withdrawal because we've got a nervous system that's not allowing us to do that. It's just like if you've got a broken leg, you're not going to go run a marathon. Yeah. So we're kind of in this, you know, this you know, catch-22, but yet it's good to be aware of it. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, I hate to throw this question on you because, <laughs> because you know, it's, uh, you know, it's <laughs> like playing with fire, but someone asked if there's any medications or supplements that you recommend taking during benzo withdrawal to help with symptoms or to help lessen the severity of benzo withdrawal. Oh, yeah. That, that is a hard question to to answer for many reasons. Uh, First and foremost, I'm not not a licensed MD. I have my doctorate in psychology and a lot of postdoc education, but I chose not to get licensed as a traditional psychotherapist. I chose to go learn how to be a coach. I prefer to do that. So I just need to put it out there if anybody's listening. Uh, I'm just gonna give you an opinion. I'm not practicing medicine here. I'm not licensed to do so and morally and ethically, I wouldn't ever do that. My humble opinion is that the best way out of benzo withdrawal is to go through benzo withdrawal. And that there there are some things that can kind of dampen the edges, but those medications come with a risk of their own withdrawal syndrome down the road. And I have seen many of my clients who just couldn't handle symptoms and said, okay, I'm gonna take this medication. And now they're trying to get off that medication and Mm -hmm. they call me in tears going, oh my God, why did I go on that? I should have just not done that. But on the other hand, I've also had clients that say, you know, I took a little bit of something and I think it really helped. And now I'm tapering off that. It's fine. I, you know, or I'm off it and it's okay. So there's no way to know, you know, we always say in the community, your mileage may vary. So we, we really don't know how people are going to respond. I just feel like since we're trying to clean our gut up, you know, get our detox pathways open up, you know, we didn't really even touch much on that, you know, because the detoxification pathways, especially, um, you know, uh, methylation, uh, there's all, you know, there's all sorts of pathways that we need to keep crystal clear. Um, medications can, can slow those down. So, I don't, I truly don't recommend anything. I do say if you are going to follow a plant-based diet, you need to make sure you're getting foods that are fortified with B12 or a tiny bit of a supplement, not a whole lot, because most of the supplements are just thousands of units more than we need. And B12 can really rev us up in benzo withdrawal. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not an advocate for adding on other psych meds to you know, to help with sleep or to help with intrusive thoughts. But having said that, I know some people have taken the risk and it's been okay. But in my practice, I've seen it, I've seen it backfire and cause a lot of problems. But if you do want to take something, I would start with the least, um, I don't even know that the adjectives are only you know, obnoxious ones, melatonin for sleep or a bit of an antihistamine, you know, start there as opposed to immediately going to like Remeron, you know, mirtazapine or, you know, the trazodone or God forbid, like mm-hmm. the Seroquel, you know, because that's mm-hmm. an antipsychotic and antipsychotics come with the risk of permanent damage, you know, movement disorders. So, 
you know, start off with the least, um, you know, invasive. help me come up with a word, you know, the, the least, least possibly, yeah, the least possible. Therapy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah damaging. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but I just want to say this before we move on. Yeah. If you are truly at the end of your rope and you feel like you can't go on, please don't think, well, Jen said, you know, less is more. If you really feel like you need something to help you stay alive, for God's sakes, stay alive. We can deal with if there's any yeah. aftermath or something else down the road. You have to stay alive, truly, because this stuff really does come to an end. So my personal opinion is less is more, but I'm certainly not judgmental of, of anything else. But I just don't want people to go to their doctor thinking that just because a doctor says, I'm going to give you this, that that's not going to be damaging or harmful down the road. We really need to do our own, um, you know, our own research and be our own advocates. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I could say from my experience, you know, I, I truly believe like the closer you get to living naturally, the healthier you're, you're going to get. And the further you get away from that, the worse it's going to get. But I, I started taking Cymbalta and Benzo withdrawal. My doctor said, oh, here, you know, and I used to trust my doctors and um, I would do what they said, you know, and shame on me, right? But, <laughs> um, but you know, and I think that's why I still haven't completely healed yet because I'm still tapering my Cymbalta. And I know lots of other guys, uh, you know, Dan in the Benzo community, he, he uh, monitors, he's a moderator of one of the forums and he's taking Remeron and he's having hellish time five years out, same as me trying to taper that and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so you know but I, I again like you say I don't like to say don't do it like that's that is a personal decision if you feel like you need to do it then do it I'm not I'm not I don't want people coming back to me later saying like oh you suggested I didn't do it and you know something happened or you know so that was a personal decision that you need to make and that's not our decision to make right so Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I have had some people who have taken something and it seemed to really help. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, your mileage may vary, but I agree with you. I, the, the more natural, the better, you know, move towards that. Um, but in the, you know, in the big scheme of things, everybody has to find their way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and again, like coming back to working on the gut and that can really help in terms of it. I know it helped me and, and, and several others reduce the severity of symptoms and, and potentially even reverse the sort of protracted, you know, illness state that you're in. Um, right. But um, so another question, and again, I mean, you're, you're not a, you're not a medical doctor, so I, I hate asking questions like this, but <laughs> um, someone's wondering how, sorry, how, how would I talk to my doctor about tapering and how should I taper the medication? What is a proper way to taper? Well, the, the best way to talk to your doctor is say that I want off this medication and ask if they're knowledgeable about that. And if they're not, you can supply them with the Ashton manual. Mm -hmm. But again, and I'm so glad that you pointed it out earlier, Scott, that there's many of us who've been in this community for a long time. And as much as we revere her work, she was the pioneer. We now know more information over, you know, she did her work in the 80s. You know, we've yeah, got a lot of, like 40 we've got years. a lot, exactly. So yeah. a lot of changed. And so, um, you know, you can, you can give your doctor the Ashton manual, but know that you don't have to move over to Valium. There is no magic about Valium. There's, there's some pros and cons to moving over to, you know, Valium or diazepam, mm -hmm. but her, her tapering timeline is a really good timeline to work with. And some yeah. people it's still a little too quick. So, but at least you've kind of got a little of a, a, a structure there, some scaffolding, but you don't have to do it just, you know, black and white, follow that. So hand that to your doctor and um, know that even if your doctor's not on board and doesn't understand it or doesn't believe in it, at the end of the day, I, and Scott, maybe, I'm curious if you have the same opinion. I think most of us end up tapering on our own without a doctor's guidance. We, we have a doctor and they prescribe our pills, but at the end of the day, we're in charge of our taper because they are just usually so ignorant. Do, do you find that to be oh, true? With the a hundred percent, you know, yeah. my doctor. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you guys, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to admit it. 
Um, I'm tapering my Cymbalta at 3% a month. My doctor thinks that's crazy. <laughs> She's like, you should be off that within a month. And I said, if I try to get off Cymbalta within a month, it would kill me. Literally, it would kill me. I tried that back in 2018. And I had a six month wave from trying that. I tried tapering, I was tapering at a, a rate of um, 25% a month or something like that. And it literally almost killed me. Like I was lying in bed, shaking with akathisia and heart, heart palpitations and the worst depression, everything imaginable. So mm -hmm. a lot of people think I'm crazy for, it's going to take me two years, two more years to get off this medication. But I'm feeling good enough where I'm not going to rock the boat and I'm not going to, and I've had many friends do that as well. And they're trying to taper off their medications while in benzo withdrawal, they're on a psychotropic, some other psychotropic drug and they rock the boat a bit too much. And, you know, mm -hmm. lo and behold, they'll go into like a six month wave. Right. So, so yeah, absolutely. I would say for the most part, you know, I'm going to throw the caveat in here just to protect myself. <laughs> Seek, <laughs> seek medical advice from your doctor. Um, and I'm not a medical, this is not intended as medical advice, but, you know, I personally believe that most doctors, the vast majority, 99% of doctors don't have a clue as to how to taper a medication like this. And they all say, you know, drop it by 10% a week or something crazy like that. And and, you know, which would, which would just destroy a lot of people and destroy me. So, um, so I recommend, yes, look, the Ashton manual is a fantastic resource for learning how to taper. Some people might need to go a bit slower. There's no hard and fast mm -hmm. rule. You know, can't say, oh, it's 10% a month is the rule or 5% a month. I mean, it really depends on the person, right? So, um, you need to decide that, you know, and um, I'd say that there are ways you could go about tapering that are, are more safe, you know, in terms of Cymbalta, like I use a little scale that I use every day. People think I'm some kind of crazy drug addict or something, but <laughs> I have my little measuring scale and I take out the beads and, you know, and there's liquid uh, tiltrations and stuff like that you could do. So there are different methods around that, but um, as far as like the, the quickness of it, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> I have not, I, I don't really have an opinion on that, I guess. Um, so uh, let's see here. So someone had another question. Um, I know, Jennifer, that you're an avid gardener, as, as far as I remember. Um, but people are wondering, you know, if, if they are functional enough, I mean, like what kind of exercise they could do, what sort of activities can they do to uh, either get some exercise or maybe just take their mind off of things and maybe work on a new project or something like that. Do you have any recommendations for that? I do. It's a great question. And, and yes, I am an avid gardener and I just recently moved back to the Bay, San Francisco Bay area to be closer to my children and my grandchildren. And I'm in an apartment now and an apartment that I don't have a yard. So I just have a balcony and it is filled <laughs> with ferns and plants in my house. You know, my bedroom's just filled with plants since I, I anyway, so I'm going to miss that. But, uh, but there's a trade-off that I get to be closer to my family. Uh, gardening is a great exercise for lots of reasons. It's, uh, there's a bacteria in the soil that we evolved with that really helps the serotonin in our gut. Uh, so it's a, it's a really good activity. Just being focused on keeping something else alive, that outward focus, it's part of the fourth cornerstone. You know, I talk about the four cornerstones of well-being. It's that last cornerstone of love well, of being concerned about another sentient, um, well, not a well, I guess plants have their own sentience, but you know, something living that's outside of us. Um, walking, walking is, is a great, great exercise. Swimming, yoga, Tai Chi, stretching, anything that's gentle. Um, the exercises that I think we need to limit or just be very careful about even getting into are the real heavy duty things that are going to get our heart rate up really high, the super stressful cardio or weightlifting. You know, if you think about weightlifting, you're, you're causing tears in the muscle, you know, some degree mm -hmm. of an inflammation. We already have so much inflammation going on in, in our body in benzo withdrawal. So let's not add more fuel to the fire. So mm -hmm. it's just, just be kind and gentle with yourself. And 
you know, just walking every day is great. And if you're not feeling all that well, but you still want to, to get, you know, out and stretch your legs, do what I did. I was bedridden for a long time. And so I got a, I got a, a walker. There's some really cute ones <laughs> on, on Amazon. I had a little seat and a little basket. And so I used my walker to walk around the block and then I graduated to a cane. Uh, so I think we need to sometimes kind of shift from that mindset of I can't, I can't, I can't because we're so sick and overwhelmed to I can, you know, I can try, I can, you know, I can, you know, you can give it, you can see what you are capable of doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there's always a way to get a little bit of exercise, even if we are completely bedridden, you know, move your arms, you know, move your legs, um, but just be gentle. You know, I, that second cornerstone of the four cornerstones is move enough. It's not move too much and don't move too little. It's find your own sweet spot. Some people might be able to walk for 10 miles. I had one client, she walked eight miles every day. And I've got others like myself. I mean, I was, you know, I felt like I should get a gold medal for just getting around the block. So do what is good for you and your body will let you know. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, last question of the day for you. Um, and I did, I did have a few more, but... I think we've sort of covered them. Some of the questions kind of mesh into other ones here, but um, if you had to list a couple of the biggest no-nos of benzo withdrawal, what would they be? Oh, biggest no-nos, that's a good question. Um, don't cold turkey, unless your life depends on it for some reason. Do not cold turkey. Do not, do not taper faster than your body is telling you you know, to go. I think a lot of people get that mindset. I'm going to show this pill who's boss. Cause I know that was my mindset too. You know, I just want off this stuff. I want to get my brain and body back. Yeah. This stuff will bite you on the butt. So just listen to your body, go slow. Don't have a date on the calendar. And you know, that that's when I have to be off really be kind and gentle with yourself and go slow, avoid alcohol, avoid yes. caffeine, Avoid over the, yes, please avoid yeah. over the counter medications that are not necessary. Um, oh gosh, there's just so much I want to say about it. Um, don't, how do I put this? Don't go down this really dark rabbit hole of convincing yourself that getting off this medication is going to be absolutely a nightmare everybody's journey is different. So don't scare yourself by spending hours in Benzo Buddies, benzobuddy.org, mm -hmm. and hearing everybody's scary story because you start to believe that that's going to be your story. Mm -hmm. um, don't, you know, don't believe a doctor. And I, and I know that, you know, that's a terrible thing to say, but don't believe that your doctor knows everything about benzo withdrawal. Do your own research find out because, you know, they have, they have advised, they advised me, you know, terrible things. My doctor was just convinced he could take me off with phenobarbital. And three days later, I was going to be okay. Well, three days later, I was rushed to the hospital and admitted for a, <laughs> for a week. Oops. Um, you know, basically it's just avoiding ingesting anything that's going to be GABAergic or be stimulating anything that's, you know, that's going to add more uh, more fuel to the fire, but also the same thing in our environment. What are you consuming in your environment? You know, that's the third cornerstone, stress less. Create a healthy, calm environment. Get off of social media. Stop watching the news. You know, all of the things that, you know, that can distract us and worry us and pull us into the future. What if this happens? So create, you know, create, um, create an environment that's going to be conducive to you staying more calm. So don't, you know, don't put yourself in really stressful situations. And there's just so much more I can say, but I know, you know, I'm kind of feeling like, you know, I know you'd like to wrap this up. I don't want to keep going on, but I want to pass that baton to you. What, what would you suggest that people don't do? Cause you've got a lived experience oh. with this as well. Alcohol. <laughs> that yeah. was a big one for me in my first year. I didn't know anything about benzo withdrawal. And alcohol was huge for me that I would have healed probably two years earlier had I not had the odd glass yeah. of wine. I'd still go out with my friends and try to, you know, 
my friends, you know, it's not like they weren't supportive. It's just that they didn't know how to support me. And their way of supporting me was dragging me out of the house and taking me drinking. Right. Yeah. They're like, you need to get your mind off of this. Right. And stupidly, I would do that. And I wasn't making the connections. And that was a huge thing for me. I would have healed at least a couple of years earlier had I not had drinks and stuff like that. Um, I would say also diet. Diet has played the biggest role in, in terms of my healing, 100%. Um, if you talk to me even a year ago, um, I was still going through the thick of it. Like I've still felt like I was dying every day. I had that doom. So it wasn't until I changed my diet around that, that things really started improving for me. Um, and doing like little things like, you know, and this is, this is sort of getting away from the subject because these are things I would do, not, not biggest no-nos, but, you know, just learning to manage stress a little bit better. And like you said, getting away from the chaos of it all. When I was so entrenched in, in benzo withdrawal, the forms could be, and, and these, these groups could be a huge blessing to have support and to have people you can relate to. But they could also be a little bit detrimental if you go too far into the abyss mm -hmm. and you're so entrenched in it that that's all you think about all day long. And it kind of like, I'm, I'm certain of it that that's sort of what kept me in waves sometimes. It's always just incessantly thinking about this, you know? <laughs> yes. um, yeah. So, so one other thing I want to get into you with you before, before we go again, and I, I could probably, I could probably just keep saying this because I have so many questions to ask you. <laughs> but can I, can I, can I just add one thing on, on sure. the don't before we, before we move on? Cause yeah. you mentioned alcohol. Um, people ask me all the time, what about CBD or medical marijuana? CBD has worked for some, but it's been a nightmare for others. Mm -hmm. um, same with medical marijuana. Um, I, I'm still of the camp that less is more. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I did try, I did try CBD that had some THC in it. And oh my God, I mean, for a week, I, I, I was practically hallucinating. I'm, and, and I was quite a ways off. And I've had clients that said, you know, I'm feeling better. And I went and I, you know, I smoked a joint because I thought I could. And now they're way back in it. So please be careful around the CBD and the medical marijuana. I know it's natural, but yeah, it's, it, it's, yeah, your mileage may vary, but just don't assume that just because it's natural, that, that that's going to be something that's going to be good for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this isn't part of the questions, but this is just sort of my own question I have for you. I know that mm -hmm. going through benzo withdrawal, you know, as we touched on in the first question, you know, life after benzo withdrawal, and for myself, you know, and even going through the thick of it, I had to, you know, I've, I always felt like this had to be for something like going through all this suffering, there had to be some kind of purpose for it. Um, it, it can't just be you suffer and then, you know, you come out the same person on the other side and there was, it was just a waste of time and there's no, no reason for it. And for me, it's been very life-changing. My attitude towards everything has changed in my life. Um, and I would say mostly for the better, if not all for the better. But I think a lot of people, you know, have a hard time seeing that, especially when they're going through it, that there's any real purpose to this. And do you have any tips on, on how people could sort of make this count? And like, what, what sort of like purpose do you really feel like you've derived from this? And, and how have you gone about sort of manifesting that? How much time do we have? <laughs> Sorry, I, I'm just. That's kidding. a long winded it's, question. I it's, know. Oh, uh, oh no, no, not not judging the question, judging judging how much I want to say about it. Um, and and I, I'm going to get teary. Everybody in my support group, mornings with Jen, know I cry. The hey, this is going to bring um, in huge ratings. We bring the tears on. <laughs> <laughs> um. Wow. As we said earlier, I am so grateful that I went through this. I hated every second of it. Um, there were times when I really didn't know if I was going to survive. Seriously, I mean, I really thought I would just either outright die from the illness or I would end my life. It was the most gruesome thing I've ever gone through. But now on this side, life is, 
it's so precious and so sacred and so filled with heartbreaking beauty um, that I never saw before, I, you know, especially having all the trauma and that I had and, you know, all the anxiety and, and just all the insecurities and whatnot, because my brain was wired for that. You know, that's what happens with trauma. Our, our whole nervous system, our brain gets rewired in a really unhealthy way. It wasn't my fault. It's no one's fault. It's our lived experience and what happens. Um, and, and I truly just don't think I could have gotten to this place unless I went through that because it was the playground, if you want to look at it that way, the Petri dish where I grew these new neuronal connections and, and, and pruned all the old ones. And, and I didn't go and get therapy. I didn't do EMDR, even though I was trained, you know, <laughs> to, to do MDR and, you know, in my grad school, you know, to get my doctorate and whatnot. It's just really living, living these four cornerstones, like really with, you know, with that intention every single day. And so what we find on the other side and I've got lots of friends and lots of clients that will call me up, you know, many years later and say, Jen, I just need to let you know, this is what my life is like. They all say the same thing. They have a greater capacity for compassion. They have a greater capacity for joy and happiness. Like we don't get bogged down in the little uh, bullshit things about life. You know, the little nuances, we just let that roll off. Whereas in the past, you know, we might've tried to, you know, like, get get our panties in a bunch over things. It is so exquisitely beautiful on this side. And I think one of the things that I now have in my life that I didn't have before is the understanding that life is impermanent. I mean, we all know that everything, you know, comes and goes and we ultimately die. I mean, it, but now I know it on a cellular and spiritual level that everything is impermanent. And I share in my support group um, Jeff Foster's uh, beautiful little couple of paragraphs, you will lose everything. If you don't know it, you might want to consider Googling Jeff Foster, you will lose everything. And the very few last sentence of that is that loss has already transfigured your life into an altar. And I live that every day, that what life has not yet taken away from me is on holy and sacred ground. And I treasure it and I revel in it and I have so much, as, as Jeff says, heartbreaking gratitude for what I have right here, right now. I now live in the moment, most of my day. I never knew how to do that before. I was always anxious about the future or regretting something I said or did in the past. I so live in the moment now. And what happens when we get to this place is whatever this creative force is in the world, call it whatever you want. I, it's easy for me to call it God, although I'm not real big on any you know, man-made religion, but whatever that flow is, that energy, that love, when we're in the moment, we are, it's like we're plugged in and we're part of that flow. And our lives then are part of creation and creation means to create, to generate, to, you know, to keep making new as opposed to being fear-based where that's destructive. So now I feel like my life is a part of this beautiful flow of energy that's about love and creation. And because of that, I find that things come to me, like what's my next step? Like now after 10 years of being in the benzo world, I'm now branching out to help people avoid these medications. Because that's what this flow of energy that I'm a part of now is putting me in that path and asking me to go. I don't push the river anymore, Scott. I don't try to make things happen. Um, you know, it's not, I'm, not being, I'm not being a couch potato. I mean, I'm, I've never worked so hard. I am exhausted. I mean, I just wrote a blog post about, I've got so many irons in the park because I'm an overachiever. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I'm passionate about helping people. I mean, that's my purpose now. So to sum it up, Please practice radical acceptance of all these symptoms. It's hard, I know, but keep your heart open. And it's okay to wail, you know, to, to rail at God. I, I can't say publicly the things I used to say. Some of my clients I've shared, it's the most vulgar thing I've ever said in my life. Um, it's okay to be angry. Just don't stay there. Don't just let it pass through you. Don't let it fester. 
know that you're going to get well. Even if you don't believe you're going to get well, you are. Just keep, I don't care how you hold on. Just don't harm yourself. Don't harm somebody else. Just hold on and get to this place because this place, just by going through that threshing machine of being polished into this side, you are going to be a better version of yourself. And you're not going to have to figure out what your purpose is. Your purpose is going to just fall in your lap. You don't have to push the river. That's what everybody tells me on this side. And I live that every single day. And I am sober. I'm happy. I'm whole. I'm confident, but I'm not cocky. Like I don't have this, my ego's right sized for once in my life. You know, I, it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to get. The journey is the hardest journey you will ever go on. But you'll get here. And if I can have two more minutes, can I share a quick story? Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay. I share this in my support group. I've never shared it publicly. And it's not my story. I don't even know where I heard it. So whoever wrote this story, I'm sorry that I'm <laughs> infringing on your, on your possible copyright. Thousands of years ago, these three salesmen were riding their camels across the desert to go to the bazaar where they were going to sell their wares to get their money for the year to support their family. But in their journey to the bazaar, a storm came up and they got lost, a sandstorm, and it was dark and scary and they couldn't see and they didn't know where they were. And they kept praying and kept praying. And, it, and an angel came and said, I'll help you. But I just want to tell you, I'm going to help you. But in the end, you're going to be happy and sad. And they just looked at the angel like, what are you talking about? Are you, we, we just, you're crazy. You know, like, just help us. We're going to be happy. She said, okay, get down and pick up a rock. As they were like clumping around, it sounded like, you know, this, this riverbed, dry riverbed. So they each picked up a rock. She said, put it in your pocket. They did. And off they go. Finally, you know, they get to the crest of a hill and they look down and there's the bazaar and the, the, you know, the fire's burning. And oh, thank God. And so she blessed them, sent them on their way. So they get there the next day, they're setting up their tents. And one of the salesmen reached into his pocket and he pulled out the rock and it was a huge gemstone. And he screams, oh my gosh, you know, Omar, whoever, you know, look in your pocket. They all had gemstones and they were so happy. I mean, that gemstone, they didn't even have to sell their wares. That was gonna, you know, really take care of them for a while. They were so happy. And then they were sad because they had no idea how to get back to where the storm was so they could go get more gems. And that's the moral of the story. You are in the storm, my friend. And it's so scary, I know, but there are gems, there are lessons, there are things along this journey. Look for them. Don't close your heart off to them. Be open, be receptive. Because once you get to this other side, you can't go back and relive that experience and say, oh, I wish I could have learned more patience while I was there. The experience is done. So keep your heart open, be receptive, trust with whatever you can, because I know it's hard to trust in this, that you're going to be okay and that the universe has you, God, whatever that energy is that we're, it's such a mystery for all of us, has you. And keep your heart open because I don't want you to get to the other side and be sad because I have to admit, I sometimes wish, even as, as, as evolved as I am now, I wish that I had heard that story earlier because I think in the depths of it, had I had that intention to look for the gems, I might have been able to mine even more for my experience. Wow, that's, yeah, that's a great story. Um, and so... Uh, where was I going with this? I had another question for you, but I think I'll leave it at that for today. I think we covered pretty much everything. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> There's so many rabbit holes you could go we, down we, with this stuff, right? I know. We, we didn't answer the second half of the question of how to taper. So I just want to say liquid taper, oh. dry taper, scales, go to the end, you know, go Google. I've got a book, uh, a tapering journal that lists different ways. There's so mm. much information out there, but I just realized that we never fully completely oh, finished okay. up that question. Yeah. But there, there, there are lots of, there are lots of methods. One's, you know, one's not better than the other in that it's whatever works best for you. That, that's what I think everybody should take away is what's gonna work best for them. 
Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I didn't go back to that. You know, I'm not, I'm not a trainer. And, and it just, it just, exactly. it, I'm not David Letterman no, no, no. here, guys. Oh, no. No, no, no. I'm just, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not, I'm not the best interviewer around, I'll say that, but, um, but so Jennifer. Actually, I, I, oh, sorry. I, I was going to say, I disagree with you. I, this has been a wonderful experience. And I used uh, to be interviewed for top tier media, you know, uh, you know, newspapers and I was on radio and TV. I did a lot of interviews at one point when my career was starting off when I was doing my other coaching. And I think you're an excellent interviewer. You've put me at ease. You've been lovely. And I think you're, you know, I think your followers will get a lot out of your, your interviewing style. Don't change it. This is perfect. Well, I, I appreciate that. You know, I think the, the great thing, and I, you know, this, this, this might sound like we're boasting of ourselves maybe a bit too much here, but um, I think the, the good thing about us is that this isn't something that we've read about in theory. You know, I, I am, I've seen a lot of interviews out there with doctors who talk about benzodiazepine withdrawal, but they've never gone through it themselves. Right. So you, it's not something right. you, could, you could fathom. You, there's, there's no way you could know anything about Mm -mm. benzo withdrawal really until you've gone through it so i think it's it's important to have that perspective coming from people who have actually really gone through the hell the hell of benzo withdrawal and um to get those voices out there because i think that you know it's it's important that we sort of warn others and you know it's it's just it's um it's it's just so sad when i see people and we talked about this earlier, people who give up, because I think people are so much stronger than they think. And yes. when they get to that other side, it's it's a different world. And it's and just trust Jennifer when she said it, that it's worth it. It gets better. And I don't care how bad it is for you. You might think you're the sickest person in the world. I think a lot of us in Benza withdrawal have said to ourselves that no one's been sicker than us. You know, it's just that constant doom feeling. We'll never get better. I'm unique. Everyone gets better eventually. Yes. You just have to make it through it, right? Yes. And you will get to the other side and have an irrepressible desire to live and to live fully. And like I said, those small little things that used to annoy you or bother you, just, it's, it's just, it's a different experience on this side. It truly is. And unless you've gone through it, There's no way to know. And even like you tell a woman who's never had a baby, you know, it's going to be painful. Yeah. She she doesn't know what that pain's going to be, but she has a point of reference for pain, right? Yeah. But there's no point of reference here. This is so out of the realm of normal body sensations and our brain and our body. Like there's no point of reference to tell people what what it might you know might be like so this you know this is way beyond the dragons on the map so yeah. any doctor who's talking about it anyone who's talking who hasn't gone through it i'm hope i'm glad that they're giving their voice you know out in the world if they're giving good information but there's yeah. no way they can know the true depths of hell that some of us suffer yeah and i i didn't i didn't mean to say that to be critical of those doctors it's just the it's just a, a fact that if you haven't gone through it then you can't oh, know, right. you can't know the extent of it, right? Right. But so Jennifer, I just want to thank you. Is there anything else you want to want to cover? I just want to, you know, get into like where people could find you and talk about your consults and stuff like that. But is there anything else that you wanted to add on top of that before before you uh, give your information out there for people to find you? No, other than just like what you just said so beautifully. And by the way, you didn't yeah. sound critical of the doctors okay. at all. Um, keep going, even yeah. when you think that you can't keep going, keep going, keep going. I know it's hard, but keep going because there is life and it's a beautiful life on the other side. So whatever it is that you need to do to hold on, hold on, do not give up because the suffering, I promise for all of us will end. Yeah. So Jennifer, um, so yeah, so you're doing, still doing consults. Um, Mm -hmm. You have an awesome website. If you guys haven't been to Jennifer's website, you should really check it out and, and read a lot of her blog posts. They really helped me back when I was in the thick of benzo withdrawal. Um, But Jennifer, you can sort of tell us about maybe some upcoming things where we could find you. Do you have, (laughs) you said you had a tapering book. Do you have any other books maybe coming out or is there any sort of projects in the works right now? 
Uh, yes. Um, thanks for asking. I just put out a little ebook. It's a marketing you know, piece, a mark, you know, marketing material for Thrive with Dr. Jen, which I did uh, post on my um, you know, on my Benzo site. So people, it, it, it's the forgotten tool for um, overcoming anxiety. I have a ebook coming out for if people who want to go plant-based, here's the plant-based starter guide for overcoming anxiety and, you know, for people in Benzo withdrawal and kind of all the do's and don'ts and why and the science and, and, you know, recipes and shopping list and whatnot to hopefully make it a little less, uh, cumbersome for people. I am still, I'm embarrassed to say, still working on my Benzo Withdrawal Survival Guidebook. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I work on it and then I realize it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to go. It's just hard. But I will get that out um, that, that I'm still working on. I am involved in um, a handful of new courses about the immune system, more uh, gut microbiome. I'm doing a deeper dive into some of the social neuroscience around trauma. So hopefully, I always kind of feel like I, I'm, I'm on this hero's journey, you know, or I've been on it, you know, I'm going down in the depths of hell and hopefully I'm gonna bring back this beautiful shiny thing for, you know, for everyone and that's my intention. So I will hopefully be able to share the jewels from all of those courses soon. I myself, hopefully, you know, January will be my start date for, really becoming super, you know, uh, you know, a registered nutrition, you know, holistic nutrition practitioner. And I'm super excited about the Thrive with Dr. Jen, because I want to help people avoid these medications. And then people who are off, if they feel like they want more help with anxiety, if they, if they need that, you know, I'll be available. And I just hired for the first time. I've always been a one trick pony. Anything you see on the internet, my websites, my books, everything I've created it. I have put it out there. This is the first time I've hired a wonderful woman um, to help me better understand how to spread this message on social media. Hmm. So expect new and improved videos. I'm even going to go, I'm a little nervous to, to, to do it, but I'm going to, you know, walk my talk and feel the fear and do it anyway. I'm going to go into TikTok. Oh, no, Jen, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going on to TikTok. So, oh. um, so I just, because I'm passionate about getting this word out there. So, you know, um, I haven't been blogging on a real, real regular basis just because I have so many irons in the fire, but keep lo looking for the, you know, on my benzowithdrawalhelp.com website, there will be more coming out. And I'll of course send links for anything up and coming. And my big thing, I won't be doing on it on Udemy, as you mentioned, but probably create a course on Kajabi, Kajabi, however you say Kajabi, it. Yeah, yeah. And it will be a masterclass on overcoming anxiety slash, you know, and, and benzo withdrawal. I'm, I will probably have a separate one for benzo withdrawal. So hopefully it'll be, you know, everything that that we know in the community, all the anecdotal evidence and everything that I know with anything that I've studied so that people can have one place that they can go and get all the information that they need so that they are either, either better prepared for doing their taper or they've got more information as they're tapering or if they're off and maybe protracted, like hopefully I can create, you know, this one place to get all the information together in one place. That's hopefully like spring or summer. Um, you know, I've just got so much that I'm doing, but that, that's, that's my goal. I, and, and my support group, which I just love. I mean, I just, it's one of the most warm and caring group of people, you know, mornings with Jen, we meet three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, nine o'clock Pacific for 45 minutes. And if you can't attend live, you know, it, it all gets recorded and can you go back and check it out. My legacy, you know, on my tombstone, my birth and my death, that dash is what matters, you know, in between those two dates. And I am dedicated every day to filling that dash with as much service to others to reduce suffering around anxiety. Um, it's what I'm just, I wake up and it's like, I'm so, I, I'm so passionate about it. I don't know how to say it without sounding rather maybe um, you know, hyperbole or um, hyperbolic, whatever the word is, but it's true. I, cause I suffered so greatly from anxiety all my life. And I don't have anxiety now and I don't have panic and, and I know things that can help. So I am dedicated to, to helping others and to creating more content that's going to be helpful. So that's me in a nutshell. Well, I can tell you guys, like I've done consults with uh, Jennifer before and she's really helped me. So 
she's a really great resource to go if you have anxiety, you're in the throes of benzo withdrawal. Um, of course, I will say, you know, uh, please respect her time. <laughs> um, I'll say <laughs> that, uh, you know, since I launched my channel, I could tell you, and I can't even imagine what it's like for you, but um, I have a lot of people emailing me and wanting to talk on the phone and stuff like that. And um, I'll be perfectly honest with you guys. I love you guys, but I have a, I have a three month old baby at home. We recently moved to a different country. Um, I have a three year old and stuff like that. So um, I do appreciate all your emails and stuff like that. But, um, you know, some of you might be upset with me for not responding, but I have a lot of other stuff going on. Um, I might be willing to do consults if you guys want to reach out to me, that, that's fine. But um, it's not always easy for myself. And I can't even imagine what it's like, like for Jennifer, you know, with all the people reaching out to her, um, you know, how, how busy she must be. So, um, yeah. So, so Jennifer, um, can you just uh, tell us, so it's benzowithdrawal.com. If they want to book a consult through there, they could do that. Benzo withdrawal help. Benzo withdrawal help. help. Dot com. Com. Yes. Okay. And I coach, I coach Monday, Wednesdays and Friday. I'm sorry, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays. Yeah. So I coach three days a week. The other two are my days where I'm creating the content and writing the books and the blog and, 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 and in my classes and, and, and that I do work with people on an emergency basis, but yeah. those, those consultations are much more expensive because I really do need my time, you know, those two days to do the other things. Yeah. Um, and it's still not enough hours in the day. I'm, I'm, I'm often, you know, my weekends get consumed with my work as well, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, benzowithdrawalhelp.com. And, and you're right. My, my inbox, my WhatsApp, my Facebook <laughs> messenger, you know, my texting, my inbox is full. And I know people get their feelings hurt. If you, you know, if I don't respond right away, or if, you know, or if, it, if I just don't ever get to them. And I think people forget like, they're one of a hundred emails that I've gotten in a day, you know, yeah. and I really do try my best to answer everybody. And, and I, you know, I spend hours that I, you know, free, free time, you know, of, of, of trying to answer people. And, um, and I can't always, cause it, cause it really is hard. So the best way to, to interact with me is to book a coaching session or to come and join the support group. Yeah, absolutely. So Jennifer, I just want to thank you so much for, for coming on, speaking with me today. Hopefully some of you guys made it right to the end because she has a lot of valuable information to share. <laughs> but, um, but I think this was an amazing talk. I really hope that maybe we could do a part two in the future because, you know, I, there's a lot more rabbit holes we could go down. That's for sure. <laughs> but, well, yeah. Anytime, <laughs> just, you know, reach out, let me know. I'm happy to do this. Um, yeah. And I just looked at the clock. I hadn't checked it before. Yeah. We've, we've gone on quite a ways, but yeah, hopefully people will watch it all the way through um, and, and, you know, or watch it enough that they get something out of it, but I'm happy to come back. Yeah. Count me in. I think what you are providing for our community is so invaluable and um i really appreciate it and i know that you know the people that follow you and know you feel the very same way we need more voices out there so thank you because i know you're not getting paid for this time you know and you are so busy with everything going on so you know for the from out of you know that that desire to be of service and out of the kindness and generosity of your heart you know we really all appreciate it thank you well same goes back to you thank you so much and um, I look forward to talking with you again. And I hope hopefully you guys enjoyed this podcast. And uh, we'll leave it at that for today. But there will be a part two at some point. So I yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So okay, thanks so much, Jennifer. Have a great day. You're welcome, Scott. You too.